Hello and welcome back to an episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben, unless anyone disagrees with that statement. On the heels of having nearly lost his life to a demon formed of an omnipotent alien agent combined with human flesh, Captain of the Rosanante, James Holden, sat in his ship's medbay pondering the destiny of humanity. A destiny that, thanks to the ability of the ship's Epstein drives to double as a barbecue, had narrowly avoided becoming eternally intertwined with the protomolecule. As comms set upon the ship where nerves had reigned, the Rosinante's engineer Naomi Nagata approached Holden to make a startling admission. She had never destroyed the Rossi's protomolecule sample. Rather, she gave it to the belt. I didn't destroy our sample. I never sent our torpedo into the sun. Naomi explained that the history of man is one beset so constantly, so absolutely by war and conflict, that great and powerful weapons are but a byproduct of human instinct. There is no turning back from the advent of that technology which brings death, so we must go forward with it, accepting it, she says, so that one human faction might not find advantage over another. And yes, we can see this truth play out in history, becoming exponentially more evident with the invention of weapons of mass destruction. Through the mid-20th century, nuclear stockpiles grew to the tens of thousands, as the USSR and the United States each raced to maintain their respective strength over the other. Had the two powers been able to cooperate, perhaps nuclear proliferation would have proceeded with more restraint. So that knowledge could preempt progress and perhaps prevent disaster. Yet, if history is indeed a guide, then the hope of restricting man's ambition is a fool's game. For where one man arrests his dream, another will fulfill it. Where J. Robert Oppenheimer, pioneer of the atomic bomb, would not contribute his talents to the development of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller would. And where in the extrasolar age, perhaps some other scientist refused to experiment with the protomolecule, Protogen could find another scientist who would. Sweet dreams. The race to obtain and weaponize the protomolecule largely mirrors that of nuclear proliferation in the mid-20th century. In neither case could states restrain themselves from pursuing the development of dangerous technology. The question now becomes, why? What are the underlying factors of conflict between states that prevents cooperation? Well, political scientists offer us methods for trying to answer these questions, and where they use them to think about things like nuclear weapons, we're going to use them to think about the protomolecule. Because I'm losing my mind, and I can't tell the difference between the expanse and real life anymore. The pursuit of the protomolecule and its weaponization can be understood in terms of game theory, which is defined quite nicely by the website Polyconomics as, quote, the science of strategic reasoning in such a way that it studies the behavior of rational game players who are trying to maximize their utility, profits, gains, etc., in interaction with other players, and therefore in a context of strategic interdependence, end quote. In other words, it studies the decisions of rational actors in a strategic social situation or game in which one decisions affect the other person or people involved. Everything is game theory, bro. So game theory sets out to apply science and math to decision making in social situations. And these games can either be cooperative, where individuals work together as a group against other groups for common goals, or non-cooperative, where it's every man or woman or Klingon for himself. One type of non-cooperative game central to game theory is called the prisoner's dilemma. An idea first framed in 1950 by mathematicians Merrill M. Flood and Melvin Drescher as part of a larger investigation into game theory undertaken by RAND Corporation, a global policy think tank that was looking for possible applications of game theory to global nuclear strategy. So what is the prisoner's dilemma? Well, let's say we have a situation in which while on the MCRN Doniger, both James Cuppa Joe Holden and Naomi Degata are accused by the Martian crew aboard of stealing five pounds of Martian homegrown coffee beans. Actually, on Mars you can't grow coffee. Shut up. Anyway, the two are incarcerated separately on the ship and are interrogated about the missing coffee. The truth is that Naomi stole the coffee, but Holden ordered her to do it, so both were rounded up by an old friend named Rico. Few will get that joke. Anyway, both Naomi and Holden are offered the same deal by authorities. Confess to the crime, and if your partner doesn't, you'll go free while the other gets punished. So as you can see on this table I made, graphic design is my passion. 
Anyway, on this table you can see that if, say, Naomi chooses to confess, then she will get off scot-free while Holden goes to prison for eight years. If Holden confesses and Naomi doesn't, she'll get eight years and he'll go free. If both confess, they'll both get four years in prison. And finally, if they both stay silent, they both get only one year locked away. Obviously, according to the framework of this dilemma, both of them should just refuse to confess, right? Well, not necessarily. Game theory assumes that all actors involved in the prisoner's dilemma are rational and self-interested. Which is exactly why I probably shouldn't be including Holden in this hypothetical. But I digress. Remember, the two of them are isolated from one another, and thus Naomi cannot know what Holden intends to do, and vice versa. Naomi sees that if she stays silent, she will either get one year in prison or eight years. On the other hand, she sees that if she confesses, she will either get zero years in prison or four years. To her, the 0-4 option seems better than the 1-8 option, and so she confesses. Holden does the same thing, and they both get four years in prison, rather than none had they just shut up. Classic game theory, bro. They choose this because this is the only outcome that satisfies Nash equilibrium, which is defined nicely by the International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences as, quote, an action profile with the property that no single player can obtain a higher payoff by deviating unilaterally from this profile, end quote. Or in other words, the strategy in a competitive game that offers a player the best payoff. The Nash equilibrium was of course named after its pioneer, actor Russell Crowe who played famous mathematician and game theory pioneer John Nash in 1998's A Beautiful Mind. But back to our little situation here. By choosing to confess, Naomi guarantees herself that she won't spend eight years in prison. I mean, yeah, she can choose to just assume James Holden won't screw her over, but I mean the dude is a coffee maniac. You can't trust him, and thus staying silent is what we would call an unstable strategy, because it involves Naomi leaving her possible doom in the hands of Holden. One cannot just have faith in the other player in a non-cooperative game where both players are incentivized to screw the other player over. Now let's look at the protomolecule situation in terms of the prisoner's dilemma. As you can see, the table is a lot bigger, and we could make it even larger if we wanted to include even more players and or more detailed options. But to keep it simple, we are going to pretend the only important entities are Earth, Mars, and the Belt, and that each is an individual actor in the non-cooperative game of trying to obtain the protomolecule and become stronger than their rival powers. So the payoffs are not necessarily equal for all here, but they're similar in a sense. If all of the players obtain and weaponize the protomolecule, then the infectious agent is in the soul system to stay, and though it can be used in some ways to bolster humanity's arsenal of weapons in the event of alien invasion, it also threatens to wipe out all of humankind. Classic game theory, bro. If only Mars obtains it while Earth and the Belt cooperate, then Earth loses its status as a superior power in the Sol system. The Belt remains subjugated, and a more authoritarian power in the Mars Congressional Republic rises to dominate the other two powers. If both Earth and Mars cooperate, but the Belt does not, then the most destructive weapon in the Sol system, next to Bobby Draper's right fist, is exclusively wielded by an unstable and unpredictable government that holds grievances against the establishment powers. If both Mars and the Belt cooperate, and Earth obtains the protomolecule, then Earth reasserts hegemony over the Sol system, and the other two powers, who have longed to achieve independence from Earth, a power that has exploited both their peoples, will now have to relinquish their dreams and ultimately kowtow before the UN. Hoorah! Of course, there are other scenarios whereby only one player cooperates and the other two obtain the weapon, and those scenarios have outcomes that are easy to imagine. For instance, if both Earth and Mars obtain the protomolecule and the belt does not, then the belt sinks into eternal subjugation to the establishment powers. Finally, of course, if all the powers cooperate, then they take out protogen, get rid of the protomolecule samples they have, and it possibly disappears from the Sol system. And though humanity's progress in exploring space is stunted by possibly eons, they also ensure that the protomolecule cannot wipe humanity out completely, and no one power can use it to dominate the others. We see very clearly that the character's actions are informed by these various potential outcomes. Why does Fred Johnson agree so quickly to help the crew of the Rosinante take Thoth Station? Uh, maybe because Fred Johnson's a freaking great guy? But is it because of some overwhelming sense of decency? Or is it because he's smart, and as soon as he sees what's happening on Eros, he realizes that whatever it is that's causing all this conflict, the Belt needs to have their hands on it, or they're going to get left behind. Fred Johnson is a careful thinker, and as a former colonel in the United Nations Marine Corps, he most likely has some education in international relations and game theory. 
He knows the value a weapon of mass destruction has to a state. And even more importantly, he knows what happens to a state that falls behind in military and technological might. It becomes much more difficult for that non-WMD state to advance its interests on the interest system stage. Who told you where to find it? Naomi Nagato. <laughs> Bitch. Now we have a deterrent. And that means power. That right there is basic nuclear weapons proliferation speak. Classic game theory, bro. Naomi Nagata obviously plays a central role in getting the belt's hands on the protomolecule. When the crew of the Rossi first obtains a sample from Eros, she convinces them not to destroy it. None of us know what we're dealing with here. And until we do, that is too important to destroy right now. I mean, you can never, never trust a goddamn belter. Anyway, Naomi isn't sure what the heck the protomolecule is yet, but she knows that it's a damn powerful substance that there might be more of lying around. And if they destroy their sample, then they make themselves vulnerable to those who don't. As we know, she eventually ends up pretending to destroy the sample and lying to the crew about it. When she explains why to Holden, she reveals her understanding of intrasystem power dynamics and weapons of mass destruction. The protomolecule has changed everything, except everything it didn't. I don't ever remember a time when Earth, Mars, and the Belt weren't fighting. She basically says that war is inevitable. Humans are always going to be involved in conflict among themselves or against alien enemies. And part of that equation is the pursuit and development of weapons of mass destruction. It's already scared too far to ever be sure it'll be gone. It's part of the equation now. The protomolecule has been discovered and it's being used, and thus there's no getting rid of it. So either you and your enemy have it, or just your enemy has it. This is a basic prisoner's dilemma, and though you might see Naomi as a traitor to the crew of the Rossi, she's right in this case, probably completely right. The protomolecule ain't going away, and if the belt doesn't have a piece, they get left behind. Earth has it. Mars has it. And the belt needs it too. Naomi isn't exactly alone here either. She's just the only one among the Rossi crew who acts on her impulses. At one point, Alex Kamal, who as a Martian has some loyalty to Mars, suggests that Mars be given the Rossi's protomolecule sample. We can give our sample to Mars. What? Think about it. They're the only players in this whole goddamn game that didn't do any of the bad stuff. Now, I don't think that Alex has thought about this as deeply as Naomi has, but he clearly has some sense that if Mars doesn't have the protomolecule, then its future could be in jeopardy. His comments show that it's pretty natural to think along the lines that the prisoner's dilemma wants you to. Alex doesn't know what the intentions of any of the state actors are, and that scares him, so he pushes for Mars to get the sample. Of course, Alex has no need to worry, because Mars has already been closely involved in working to weaponize the protomolecule in concert with the Protogen Corporation. Not to leave Earth out of the mix, though, Protogen also partners with the United Nations via UN Undersecretary Sadovir Ehrenreich to develop a weapon from the protomolecule. Now, Ehrenreich commits a series of unscrupulous actions during his time at the UN that paint him fairly as the villain. But I'm not so sure it can be said unequivocally that his actions in pursuing protomolecule proliferation are completely unjustified, and they certainly aren't completely illogical. This was a way to guarantee the safety of the Earth. At a terrible price. You're the one who taught me that Earth must come first. If we take Aaron Wright at his word, he was doing this for Earth. And he might have known that Mars was trying to get their hands on a protomolecule weapon as well. What would you do if you were in his position? Try to persuade and pressure Mars to give up their pursuit of this weapon of mass destruction, or try to get Earth in on the action as well? Classic game theory, bro. Meanwhile, UN Deputy Undersecretary Christian Vassarala might have stood against Aaron Wright for his actions, and yes, she eventually takes him down, but she also isn't so naive that she has no interest in getting Earth a sample of the protomolecule, especially after she discovers that the belt has one. I need to understand the protomolecule, and for that, I need a sample. For the good of Earth, Mars, and the belt. Now, it's easy to see James Holden as the hero in all of this. He's honest, he's idealist, he's pure. But Avasarala, and I'll get more into her mindset when I do a video on her, is much more cynical and realist. You're not a child. I suspect you never were. So stop acting like one. 
A Vasarala, just like Naomi, who has the nerve to question a Vasarala's honesty, knows that the proto molecule is here to stay because it means power, and whoever has it wins, and whoever doesn't loses. Avasarala's viewpoint largely mirrors that of American or Western exceptionalists who believe that only so-called responsible powers should be able to have nuclear weapons. I personally echo the idea that we don't want nuclear weapons in the hands of a nefarious actor, but the notion that weaker powers are going to allow themselves to be easily persuaded out of obtaining weapons of mass destruction by superpowers goes against the fundamentals of game theory. And such efforts on the part of the superpowers to do so have been the subject of international treaties since the advent of the atomic bomb. And there's obviously been varying degrees of success. Where such treaties have certainly resulted in nuclear weapons proliferation becoming a non-normative behavior, actors like North Korea still engage in it. Why? Well, because such is a rational action. Weapons of mass destruction endow states with leverage and a bulwark against influence and intervention from other nations. Now, before I leave you off feeling worse about the world than you did when you came into the video, the prisoner's dilemma is just a theory, and its conclusion isn't necessarily always true. It's the James Holdens of the world, the idealists, the people committed to morality before rationality, and yes, also the psychopaths, who allow for game theoretical conundrums to be overcome. People can cooperate. They don't always pursue the dominant strategy because people are not necessarily entirely rational, and because in real life, games are iterated meaning they can be played more than once. Players can learn from previous games and try different strategies. Of course, this also implies that players can cooperate one game, get screwed over, and then defect the next. Trust a belter once, you'll never do so again. However, the allure of the Nash equilibrium is strong, and thus it takes a lot of thinking and effort on the part of players in order to break free of the prisoner's dilemma. So where do we end up thanks to this WMD rat race? Well, with the evolution of the protomolecule into the ring gate and later the ring gate system, and all three powers doing everything they can to hold themselves back from unrestrained exploration into the unknown. This is what security dilemmas and competition can engender. Man makes progress out of fear, and no such progress leads to answers that can help protect and perpetuate humanity. Too much progress too soon can lead down many paths that end with the extinction of the human race, or at least can put humanity into a precarious situation where we're playing with fire. A fire that we're enthusiastically stoking, but don't actually know how to put out. Classic American Ben. Anyways, that is the video. Um, Hope you enjoyed it. Wasn't too hot this time, probably because I shot at night. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please do give it a big like comment down below. Say something. Um, remember to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.